Major underwriting for A Taste of Louisiana with Chef John Foles was provided by the Baton Rouge Convention and Visitors Bureau. In Baton Rouge, our past is your present. Baton Rouge, authentic Louisiana at every turn. And People's Drug Stores, serving South Louisiana for generations. George and Shirley Piku are proud supporters of A Taste of Louisiana with Chef John Foles. And by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Our mission is to tell Louisiana's story to the world. And by the Louisiana Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism. Where you have this architecture, history, music. And the bittersweet cry of the blues. Especially the blues. There you go. How about a dozen? Red beans and rice. We rolling, y'all. We're a nation of immigrants, a country with roots in other soils. Nowhere is that more true than in the country of Louisiana. I'm Chef John Falls, inviting you to tune in to A Taste of Louisiana and a new series dedicated to our food heritage. Louisianians are descendants of seven primary nations that have influenced every dish we cook today. Welcome to A Taste of Louisiana. All right, hey, all right, Andrew. <laughs> How you doing, Andrew? All right, how are you doing? <laughs> Hey, y'all, Bobby Leonardo right here, the band. Y'all give him a big hand. <laughs> Somebody told me there was Italians in the house. Um, oh, absolutely, there's Italians in the house. <laughs> y'all, we have a great, great uh, show in the kitchen today. I tell you, welcome. Uh, it's, uh, we're concentrating on the great cultures that make up what we call the wonderful cuisine and culture of the Bayou State, Louisiana. And when you think of the great nations that all came together and intermarried and created the Crayolas, the mixtures uh, over the years, you think of the Italians way up at the top when you think of great food, family, you think of religion, you think of parties, you think of music, oh, you think of Bobby. <laughs> That's what you think about. <laughs> we're, um, we're cooking a couple of great Italian dishes for you today. I'm baking a redfish. You, uh, uh, you don't want to get up. That's all I'm going to tell you. Just, just relax and meet your neighbor there for a minute, okay? Not only did the Italians bring a tremendous work ethic to Louisiana, they came with a love of family and an incredible faith. The St. Joseph's Day altars are a true testament to their strong beliefs. If you never experienced an altar, mark March 19th on your calendar. It's an experience you will never forget. Margot Battaglia Claymont and Margaret Teeter introduces us to this continuing Sicilian and South Louisiana tradition. The tradition of St. Joseph's altars came to Louisiana with the Sicilian immigrants in the late 1800s. According to legend, a drought in the Middle Ages killed Sicily's vegetation and dried the streams and wells, leaving people to die of hunger and thirst. Desperate for help, the people prayed to St. Joseph, the foster father of Jesus, and the patron saint of Italy. If their petition for rain was answered, they promised to honor him perpetually on his feast day March 19th. At midnight on the day their prayers were offered, it rained and the people were saved from famine. Still today in Sicily and in Louisiana, St. Joseph is remembered in elaborate food altars. Altars are constructed throughout South Louisiana in homes and churches erected in his name. Food preparation begins weeks in advance. Because this is a Lenten celebration, there's no meat on the altars. Often individual altars to St. Joseph's are built in answer to personal prayers and favors. The altar tradition in our family um, began 42 years ago um, by my grandmother. It was something that she started in answer to a prayer petition that she had petitioned St. Joseph to intercede for her to God the Father um, that my uncle would survive a brain cancer surgery. Um, he had brain cancer and, and they didn't give him any good prognosis to survive. So she prayed to St. Joseph to intercede and that if the prayer was answered, she vowed that she'd wear brown for the rest of her life and that she would prepare an altar in Thanksgiving. And of course he did. So for 
um, the rest of her life. She wore brown. She did the ultra tradition. When she passed away, my Aunt Marion carried on the tradition in the family. And then seven years ago when she passed away, um, I decided that I would conti continue the altar tradition in the family. Altar breads are made into various religious shapes. Palm branches symbolize the Blessed Mother. The crook and ladder signifies St. Joseph. The cross represents Christ's passion and death. A large red fish symbolic of Christ is placed on the saint's table in Louisiana. Cookies include fig, sesame seed, ginger, lemon, orange, cherry, and chocolate. Pignolati, or haystack cookies, are made as well as lamb-shaped cakes covered with shredded coconut. Lilies, candles, wine, and religious statues also adorn the altars. The parish priest usually blesses the altar at night before the celebration. Pasta is served at altar celebrations with hard-boiled eggs. Instead of sprinkling the spaghetti with Parmesan cheese, dried Italian bread toasted with sugar is used. This molica represents St. Joseph's sawdust. It's not unusual to need 110 pounds of spaghetti and 40 gallons of sauce for the hundreds of altar visitors. Today, the person hosting the altar invites special people to represent favorite saints at the altar table. The celebration begins with the Holy Family dressed in costumes and bread crowns, parading outside the house, and then knocking at the door. The Tupa Tupa is a reenactment of Mary, Joseph, and Jesus after they were sent into exile looking for shelter and food. Um, we reenact it every year here at St. Joseph Catholic Elementary with our school children. Um, it goes along with our altar on St. Joseph's Day. The children start out at the first end. They knock. They're turned away. They go to the second inn where they're knocked and they turn away, no food, no shelter. And they, they're received at the last inn that they knock at, which is where the altar is set up. And um, they go in and they're served from the altar food and, and, and drink. And along with the family, the angels rejoice. And it's a reenactment, like I said, of them finding food and shelter. St. Joseph's bread, fava beans, and visits to numerous altars are all considered lucky. During the year, altar crumbs in St. Joseph's bread are tossed into violent storms to prevent destruction. Everyone visiting an altar receives gifts of cookies, fava beans, St. Joseph's bread, prayer cards, and sometimes religious candles. This unique centuries-old Sicilian custom of creating St. Joseph's Day altars showcasing Italian foods is a magnificent gesture of charity and faith. Y'all, I, I just went over to the St. Joseph's altar right there, my beautiful little in-kitchen altar, and I have my St. Joseph's card and my fava beans for my pocket. As long as I have my fava beans, I'm going to be lucky, so I got them right here. Y'all, what great faith. Think about this, a culture making a promise in the Middle Ages and still every single year on March the 19th honoring that pledge and passing it down from generation to generation. That's the uh, uh, Italian et ethic right there. You don't have to say anything else. And of course, with great faith comes great work ethic, comes great family, comes great success, and it's the story of our Italians. Really fantastic. A couple of wonderful Italians in the audience today that I have to, uh, I have to just uh, share with you. First of all, Sandra Scalisi Juno. She's making one of those wonderful cuchinadas right there, right? Huh? Look how beautiful that is. Huh? Thank you. And it was, and it was uh, Sandra. It was Sandra and her family, and I know that uh, y'all kind of all around the table right here. I'm sure your family's all over the audience, but y'all did a magnificent job on that altar right there. What a beautiful little little altar! Absolutely. <laughs> Y'all saw just a minute ago Margot Bata uh, Bataglia Clément. She was in the piece, and she's right here, very uh, uh, right there. Huh? Uh, <laughs> and then Margaret Teeter. Margaret Teeter. Uh, uh, I thought for a minute since she had so many children around her that she was a teacher, but in fact she just put all the kids together to go do the tupa tupa and knock on the door. And uh, one of the one of the uh, young men in that piece was is in the audience right there, Benjamin in the pink shirt. Wave to everybody, Benjamin, right there. Wave. Keep that hand up, Benjamin. <laughs> an Italian, an Italian kitchen wouldn't be an Italian kitchen without Joe Maselli. Joe Maselli right here. 
And then uh, Andrew Capone as well. Andrew, a great historian on, on Italian as well as Cajun and Civil War and all of that. Uh, I, I sat around all night trying to figure what was the dish I would do for you today. Uh, and St. Joseph's altar, I noticed it right in the center of each one of them, the baked redfish. Sometimes uh, covered in a crust or dough, sometimes stuffed, sometimes not. Well, I decided to, uh, to get one and make it for you right here. First of all, the redfish, this one right here is about a two pound uh, redfish and I'm gonna season it uh, nicely, just a little seasoning inside and out, a little pepper as well into it. You wanna season it uh, really nice because remember, no meat on the St. Joseph's uh, altar. I've cut slits into the side of the fish. I'm gonna put a little herbs in here, a little basil, a little Time. If I wanted to stand the fish up on the altar, I would stuff the belly with either some type of a bread or crawfish stuffing or crab stuffing or aluminum foil. Just it pounds the fish out and it sits nice and flat as it cooks. It's a good way to do it. Now I'm going to take the seasoned fish and put it into, look, you notice those onions down there, Keith? Uh, the onions keep the fish from sticking and breaking in the bottom of the pot. So that's going to sit right here until I make the sauce that, uh, that goes with it. I'm going to begin with a little extra virgin olive oil here right into the pot. I want to get this sauce cooking because after all, this is the uh, main flavor of the dish. We're going to start with extra virgin and then a little bit onion. Oh. And we're cooking here, we're cooking, huh? I told you cast iron cooks. A little onions, a little celery, a little bell pepper. How about garlic, y'all? You want that, huh? Yeah, I bet, huh? <laughs> oh, yeah. While this is sauteing right here, the amount of work that must go in. Now, you have an in-home altar, Margot. The amount of work that goes into it must be incredible, huh? That's a lot. We start on um, cooking several months in advance. How, how many? How much time? How much? Uh, how um, much time is actually spent putting the whole altar together? It's so elaborate. It takes me about a week of pre preparation, as far as decoration, but as far as baking, and my mother does most of the baking by herself. Right. Uh, about two months ahead of time. Now, now Sandra, you uh, you work on your home altar, but you work on about six or seven different altars, don't you? What I do is I make the large cuchilladas and I, and I ship them wherever, and I've shipped my cakes to Seattle and Chicago and California. Uh, and to many of the authors in uh, Louisiana. And this tradition is just being kept alive. You're, you're third generation doing the altars, and do you see the, 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 the tradition growing, or do you see it having to be really pushed to perpetuate it? It's actually growing in our community. More altars yeah. have been set up. See that? Mm -hmm. Italians keeping that culture alive. Onion, celery, bell pepper, garlic, y'all. Into this, I'm making the tomato sauce that's going to go onto my fish. This is chunky tomatoes. I'm actually using tomatoes in the can because I can't get good tomatoes all year long, so I get those nice San Marzanos, the nice plums. I'm putting a little tomato sauce in here. Basil, bay leaves, you got it? Huh? Huh? A little fennel, you with me? Huh? You with me? Huh? Green onions, right? Huh? What can I can put a little uh, val, uh, little, little uh, Valpolicelli gans here. You know, I can put a little, oh, little uh, Chianti. I can just keep on going. Anyway, y'all cook this long and slow. Cook your tomato sauce for about an hour. Season it with salt and pepper. And look, uh, right here, I'm going to put it, I have it in a pitcher right here. I'm going to pour it over the fish. I'm going to get it right into the fish so that we can get the fish in a 350 degree oven and y'all when it comes out take a look at what it looks like right here oh you talk about delicious just stay right there I might give y'all something to eat in just a second there <laughs> you might judge the quality of an Italian cook by the spaghetti sauce that they cook or by the stuffed artichokes but the real test I think of an Italian cook the cuchadadas, those fabulous fig filled cookies I went to master fig cookie maker Sandra Juno who y'all just met for a lesson. I went to our home. I'm going to finish the fish. Y'all, I'm very excited to be in the home of one of my great friends, Sandra Scalisi Juno, who's a fourth, fourth generation, I think, Italian or fifth. Yeah. <laughs> See, I missed a generation. <laughs> fifth a generation Italian from Sicily. And of course, I'm here today to get a lesson. You, I consider you the expert in one of the most famous of Italian cookies that's always found on a St. Joseph's uh, altar, and that's the cuchidado. Did I say that that's right? That's correct. You oh, certainly cuchidado. did. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, uh, what is it exactly? A cuchidado is a specialty cookie that is so 
much a part of the St. Joseph's altar tradition. It's a fig filled cookie that can be either bite sized, it can be in many different shapes, and sometimes it's done in elaborate shapes of different religious symbolism yeah, on the, the St. Joseph's altar. The big hearts and the staffs and all that. Right. Now let's talk about the ingredients that okay. uh, goes uh, into it. Now see, this has to be a dough, right? Yes, it's a very simple basic dough with just flour and Crisco and then a little addition of sugar and water. And the key element is just the right amount of moisture. Yeah, so, so the texture is very important and that's yes. that's why I need the lesson because I would never get <laughs> now, now the filling is also extremely important. Yes it is and what you start with is a dry Greek fig right. and then you season those figs. You have to cut the little stems off right. and then you season those figs. Now, I with, couldn't use the figs out of my backyard mm, tree, right? Not really because oh, the okay. texture would not okay. be right. But you season the figs with honey, orange zest, cinnamon, and a little touch of black pepper. And then you told me you grind bite. them through a meat grinder. Yes. Look at this texture is really fantastic. Now, once the dough is rolled out and this nice texture is achieved, you have the cookie right here. Now, how do you wrap it? Yes. Them? Well, you, you roll out a strip of the dough, right, and right. then you just roll, roll it like it. that. Like that, pat it and, down. And these could be in any length or whatever. In you any want length them to be. that you like. I right. use the rule of thumb. Right. I like to do one. <laughs> the rule of thumb, one thumb right. long. Exactly. All right, exactly. And then you cut a little shape. Right. And what you're doing actually is incorporating air into it right. so that when it bakes, it will bake completely through. Oh, but what you beautiful. finish with is a leaf design that's just really. Now Quite that's going to go into what, about a 300, what, uh, what degree about oven? About a 300 degree oven. What you want is to bake them very slowly right, so okay. that the, the dough remains very white. And, and, and I notice after they bake, then you're going to put a little fondant icing yes. and some nice little sprinkles. And here they are in the finished state right here. Yes. And they look absolutely, uh, absolutely fantastic here. Look how beautiful they are. Well, they're fun to eat, too. They yeah. quickly disappear, I have to tell you. For Christmas holidays, St. <laughs> Joseph's, all of the holidays. Now, you were telling me you have a really nice, big design of one of them back here. Can I see it? You certainly can. <laughs> I have that sitting on the dining room table waiting all for right. you to see. Let's go see that. Boy, these are absolutely beautiful right here. I'm just Thank absolutely you. wonderful. We have a larger version, actually, of what we were making in the kitchen the small cookies. Right. This is like a larger pie with the filling on top of a dough, and then you put another layer of, of dough on top, right, so and then you cut decorative designs. So you can make, so you can make a mini size any shape. So what are you making here? However the spirit moves you. <laughs> and what we're doing, working for St. Joseph's Day, is St. Joseph's walking oh, stick. That is absolutely beautiful. You're gonna have to show me how to make this. I promise I will. Uh, and I'm gonna hold you to it. Okay. Huh? <laughs> absolutely gorgeous, fantastic work. Thank you. All right. Little uh, limoncello. All right. Hey, y'all. Thank you so much. <laughs> Anybody ever had a little limoncello? Anybody ever had a little taste of limoncello? Yeah. Huh? This is my homemade limoncello, y'all. I tell you what, I just, and I hadn't had a chance to taste it just yet. Oh. 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 <laughs> Joe, what you think? Good. Say it better. Good. I'm Italian. I'm, I'm half Italian. I knew that. In my heart. I knew it. <laughs> y'all, wasn't that a great, uh, uh, wasn't a great visit to Sandra's kitchen? And, and y'all, oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> And one of, the, uh, one of the things I want to do, uh, very simply, there's a great pasta dish on the St. Joseph's altar. And of course, since you can't have meat, the Italians are just really, uh, I mean, the imagination, the innovation in the kitchen is just incredible. It doesn't matter what the dish is. But this spaghetti sauce is absolutely no different. Very, very simple. And I'm going to put some onion sweating here for the uh, pasta melanese. This is the, Milan, the, the sauce of Milan that has no meat in it but it has a couple of little fish that you all love. Anchovies. Mm. Oh yeah, let me get some more limoncello. Mm. Uh, huh? <laughs> ah. Anchovies, sardines. Oh, that's the meat that's in this sauce right here. So y'all, I have my olive oil going. You see the smoke? 
We're gonna put this in here. We're gonna put about two big cups of onions in there. Saute that around just a little bit. And then the garlic right in there as well. I'm gonna let this kinda, uh, just kinda sweat around a little bit in the pot, become translucent. Uh, and it's gonna take just a couple of minutes to do that. Just enough time, in fact, for me to ask, Sandra, you have a beautiful altar here. Tell me about the foods on the St. Joseph altar. Well, where do you begin? <laughs> you know, the whole uh, theme of a St. Joseph's altar is abundanza, abundance. And I think uh, the more beautiful foods that you have, the more abundant. It's the celebration of Thanksgiving for the abundance of beautiful foods. So where do you begin? The vegetables, there are so many gorgeous vegetables. One of the um, very um, notable vegetables is the kajuni which is the large stock vegetable. Right. Uh, when mom and I would go to the grocery store, people would stop and say, what is that in your basket? <laughs> you know. uh, but the kaduni is fried. There are also frosia, which is vegetable omelets with um, finocchia and green beans and all the wonderful things that grow, all the green things, stuffed artichokes. Sure. Um, and then, of course, the, uh, the cooked foods, there is the pasta milanese, which is served with the redfish. Right. Uh, just wonderful, wonderful foods. And, and, as and you then, said, of course, all the cookies and that wonderful uh, kuchu dye that you're making there. Yes, well, the many, many cookies. You know, every flavor that you can imagine is, is incorporated into the cookies. Of course, my fav favorite is chocolate. Uh, you know, <laughs> who who else this. is favorite? Uh, <laughs> right. But I, when you mentioned the breads. We did a, a picture of one of the... But all of the breads and all the di different shapes on the altar are just absolutely, and all of them have significance. Yes, each each um, shape of a bread or a fig cake, kuchidada, has a religious symbolism. The circle is the symbol of everlasting love, of eternal love. Uh, the heart, which is on the altar, is the shape that symbolizes the sacred heart of Mary. Right. The cross symbolizes Christ. But it's interesting that the cross is a symbol of the risen Christ because it has the flowers in bloom. Ah. Um, the, um, the, what looks, some people call a walking, a, a, a candy yeah, cane, walk the is actually the staff of St. Joseph. And the symbolism of that is that St. Joseph's little simple walking stick, because of his purity, sprouted a lily. So it's always shown with the flowers. And Unbelievable bloom. tradition, and, and yeah. it's carried through to the family, and all the children are taught about. It. I mean, it's just absolutely incredible. I love the history of Italians, the religious history as well. And uh, let me throw the rest of this because I have to ask Joe uh, a question that I know you're going to have a, a wonderful answer to. I'm putting my tomatoes in here. I'm using tomato sauce. I'm using a really rich tomato puree. I'm using uh, tomato paste. This is one of those real tomato sauces here. Uh, a little basil in, of course, uh, a thyme in there, all of the one that you can put a little oregano in here, of course, and then a little, just let this cook down. I'm gonna put the anchovies right here. Oh, oh yeah, and uh, I'm gonna throw one or two sardines in there for good luck, huh? <laughs> oh, I love sardines. I'm gonna let this cook for a minute. Joe, what about the, the tradition in Sicily at, uh, versus Louisiana? Are they about the same in this tradition? Well, the origin, of course, is Sicily, but I'd say Louisiana's kept that origin going. In fact, it's outdone the old country. So, so in other words, we're keeping it as alive, this, if not more alive, and they're coming over here to learn it. <laughs> largest Sicilian uh, population in the United States, percentage-wise. Yeah, right, right, right here in New Orleans, right here in Louisiana. Louisiana. And y'all take a look at the sauce with the, oh, oh, you, right over the spaghetti. It's going to be served along with the baked redfish, and uh, Sandra, Murica. Modica, I call it. She's been giving me a lesson all day. Modica. Modica or Malika, whatever you want to call it. Modica, Sandra says. Modica, right here. And it symbolizes the sawdust of St. Joseph, right correct. on top of the spaghetti, because you absolutely not, not supposed to put any cheese on top of that, right? That's correct. Y'all, so here it is. We have stuffed artichokes right next to it. It's really fantastic. The sauce is here. The redfish, I put one in the oven. We have one here. Uh, just great, great, great Italian dishes. And y'all, thank you so much for sharing all of that with us, and especially your family on that wonderful altar. Just great. Y'all, time flies when you're enjoying good food and good conversation with friends in the kitchen. 
Thanks for stopping by as we continue to explore our unique food heritage and cook up another great taste of Louisiana. I'm finishing the tomato sauce. All right, y'all. <laughs> To purchase the Encyclopedia of Cajun and Creole Cuisine by Chef John Bowles, featuring more than 750 traditional recipes, a CD-ROM of the book, or a copy of the program featuring all three episodes of Today's Culture, call the number on your screen. Major underwriting for A Taste of Louisiana with Chef John Foles was provided by the Baton Rouge Convention and Visitors Bureau. In Baton Rouge, our past is your present. Baton Rouge, authentic Louisiana at every turn. And People's Drug Stores, serving South Louisiana for generations. George and Shirley Piku are proud supporters of A Taste of Louisiana with Chef John Foles and by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Our mission is to tell Louisiana's story to the world. And by the Louisiana Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism. Where you have this architecture, history, music, and the bittersweet cry of the blues. Especially the blues. There you go. How about a dozen? Red beans and rice. We rolling, y'all.